All right, on to lecture two. Um, we're going to cover lenses, magnification, and beam expanders today. I'm going to apologize for the background noise. I am recording while in the car on the way vacation with family, but uh, that's the beauty of modern technology is that I can get to the lecture still. The image today is a great one to start with. You can see a water stream that's breaking up into droplets, and you can see how it's actually generating little lenses here, and that's one of the topics we'll talk about. And Another beautiful image is shown in this one where there's an object in the background and you can see it coming into focus in these tiny little droplets on a wire. So I thought I'd share that one as well. One note um, for the quiz this week. Starting this week, you'll have basically used some of the equations in both the lab and in the homework. So at this point, the quizzes will also start to incorporate ca calculation style problems from the previous week's lab. And so you should come prepared for the quiz this week with some with ready to do some calculations too. Um, I don't expect you to memorize equations. You can always look them up on the internet or wherever you, else you want to. So what you can bring to the quiz each week is a third of a sheet of paper with anything you want on it. You can keep adding to it, for example, such that three weeks from now it's a full sheet, and then you can start a second sheet, etc. So you can keep these sheets throughout the semester. So today, to do the the lenses and other applications of lenses, we only need to consider ray optics. So we'll keep things fairly simple, but you'll see mathematically it can be a little bit intense as well. We're going to derive the basic lens formula. We're going to look at positive and negative uh, lenses and imaging planes. We're then going to combine lenses to make beam expanders and telescopes. And then we're going to look at some advanced stuff such as microscopes, numerical aperture, variable focus lenses, etc. So before we get started on lenses, a brief review of Snell's Law, because we're going to need that for lenses. Remember, Snell's Law says that the refractive index out here, N1, times the sine of the incidence angle, theta1, is equal to the refractive index in here, times sine of the refracted angle, theta2. The key thing I want to iter re reiterate here is that theta1 and theta2, incidence and refracted angles, are with respect to the normal of the surface. So here's the surface normal, meaning that it's with 90 degrees of the surface. And you have the same thing here, within, with the surface normal, with the surface normal. Okay, so we'll need that when we start to look at the, uh, the lenses. So what I want to do now is I want to take Snell's Law and derive the basic lens formula. The reason why I want to do this is that if I just give it to you, you're like, well, this is just some magic formula that came from somewhere. But I'd like to show you how you can derive that just using some simple trig and, uh, and the uh, Snell's Law. So let's start to look at a lens, and we'll just look at the first interface here of a lens. So here's my glass, here's my air, and you can see the surface of the lens. And this lens will have a curvature, R. So here's R here. Here's my curvature. So it would be a constant curvature as this lens traces out in either direction. Okay, And by convention, because I'm drawing my curvature here in the higher refractive index material, this is glass, refractive index of maybe 1.5, this is air, refractive index of 1, then I say that my radius of curvature here, R, R, is positive, meaning that this is a convex surface or a convex lens or a positive lens. We'll use all those terms. Now, we'll do it a little bit later, but what would happen if N2 was less than N1. Well, what if this was the glass and this was the air? Well, in that case, the lens would not look like this, but the lens would look like this. And in that case, you still have a radius of curvature, but it becomes negative or concave, because I have a concave surface here as opposed to a convex surface. That will be a negative or concave lens. We'll talk about that, but let's start with a positive or convex lens like we have here. Okay, uh, let me briefly um, erase this here so we can have space for everything. Well, it's not erasing. Okay, so what we're going to do now is we're going to assume that light travels from a point P1, Z1, P1 equals Z1, 0. So it starts at a distance Z on the Z axis, Z1, and the height on the Y axis here is 0. So it starts at Z1, 0. It hits the glass surface at a position 0, Y. So we'll call this 0, Z1, and out here Z2. So Z axis, position 0. And it hits the axis here, the lens, at a height Y. So you can see we've mapped Y out here. So here's the height Y, 
with respect to the z-axis, okay? And where it's going to end up at is at a point P2, which is at a position Z2 on the z-axis, and again, the height now is back to zero because it's right on the z-axis, so Z2, zero. Now, what I'm going to do next is I'm going to add a dotted red line here. You can see it here, which is aligned with the radius. So if here's my center of this radius, okay, so if I trace out this, this is the center of the radius at C. I'm going to draw a dotted line, red line from there, so it's aligned with the radius, and the reason why I'm doing that is that I know that if I draw, draw this line like this, it will be perpendicular to the surface, because the radius is always hits the edge perpendicular to the surface. So this is perpendicular to the surface, and that's what I need to set up Snell's Law here. So now I've got a line perpendicular to the surface, and I can start to look at incidence and refracted angles. So. What I can do then is I'll use Snell's Law with respect to this dotted red line, and I'll say something very simple here, N1 sine of the incidence angle, which is theta1 plus phi, that's the little angle in here with respect to the dotted line, that's my total incidence angle, is equal to N2, the angle in here, phi minus negative theta2. How did I get that? Well, I'm going to zoom in here over here, and you can see that if this is phi here, okay, and I draw a straight line, draw a straight line, if that's phi here, well, obviously, I have phi here as well, okay? And so if I have phi in both locations, sorry, brief pause there, and so, again, the key point is I'm looking for this angle here, well, this angle in here would be phi minus this, if I want to get this value. Now, I know that I'm saying this is minus theta 2. Don't worry about that. It'll work out later. But I'm just going to call it negative theta 2 for now, so don't worry about that. So I've got this now set up. And for small angles, I can simplify this further because the sine of theta in radians approaches theta for small angles, which we'll assume is accurate for this case. So we can simplify this down then from this equation to this by dropping out the signs. And then all we're going to do is solve for theta 2. So I've solved for theta 2 in this equation. Now, we're going to take this simpler by also recognizing that tan of phi approaches phi. And so if I look over here, and here's phi, okay, and there's y, and there's r. So I've got r here and y here, opposite over, I mean adjacent over opposite for the tan of the angle. Then I can represent phi as being y over r. So there's y and there's r. Project them down to this triangle. So I'll get rid of the tan because I'm also at small angles. So if I do that, I can take this equation I have here, and then I can again substitute in that tan of phi for phi, but also for my incident angles of theta 1 and theta 2, get rid of my thetas, and I'll end up with the following equation here, where I have everything now in terms of refractive indices, position z's, and the radius of curvature of the lens R. So we're getting closer to the lens equation at this point. One thing you should notice right off the bat here is that if I have a bigger difference in refractive indices or a smaller radius, then these Z's get smaller, meaning that I could probably, you'll see something, if I raise refractive indices or R, you'll see that Z's will move in closer to the lens. And we'll see that when we look at positive lenses and how they work. Okay, so now let's do the same thing, but let's do it for a more real case where we're not starting on the optical axis, but we're starting up here at a position P1, where not only do I have Z1 here, but I'm up, up, up at a position Y1 above the Z axis here. And so what I'm going to do here to, to, to move this forward is I'm going to basically just look at moving through the origin here to position P2, which is a position Z2 out here, and a height Y2 away from the Z axis. And so this is pretty easy to do because I can simply see the angles of incidence and refraction using the same triangles. So there's, here's an angle, a triangle here, and then I have a triangle here as well. And I can do the same tan, tangent approximation and solve for theta incidence and theta refracted, refracted as well. I can then relate these via Snell's Law and achieve the following equation. And again, you're already seeing some of the lens type effects here. Notice that if I change Z1 and Z2, I could change 
what I end up getting for Y2 and Y1 because these are fixed. If you have a lens, it already has a certain refractive index N2, air doesn't change. And so all you can change are the Z's here. And as I change those, the difference between Y1 and Y2 will therefore have to change. So you basically will see that this could get higher or shorter depending on your starting position Z1. Next what we're going to do is you're going to apply this to a thin lens in air. So here's my thin lens. It's no longer just a front surface, but I'm putting another surface on the other side which has the exact same radius. So here was my original radius, and now I have a radius coming from this side too. So we'll assume the radii are equal. And then it can be shown that, meaning I'm not going to go any further with the derivation, that you can get the following equation for this. Okay? And so it says 1 over f, which is the focal length for this. The focal length for a lens is when you have parallel light coming into the lens, it always converges on the focal point, which is at the focal length f. So if I had light coming in here, parallel to this axis, it would come down to F. Light here would come down to F, and light here, of course, would hit F as well. So that's my focal length point, F, at a distance F, away from the center of the lens. I'm going to skip past this and go to the simplified version. 1 over F is approximately equal to the refractive index of the lens, minus 1. So N is now just the refractive index of the lens itself. And then it's multiplied 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2. That's the radius of curvatures on either side. Now for simplicity in this lens, the radius of curvature is the same, so this could be just 2 over R. But they could also be different, and if they are different, such as you'll see there's some other types of lenses that we look at that have different curvatures on either side, then you can substitute those in directly. Also, with, this, with these derivations, you can get the following relationships. 1 over the focal length is equal to 1 over Z1, the object distance that I put in front of the lens plus 1 over Z2, the image distance that you see here past the lens. You can also relate the height of the object in the image. In this case, Y1 here is the object height at a Y1. Y2 is the height out here. And relate that to Z1, object distance, Z2, image distance, and of course, the ratios of the height, if my height appears bigger or smaller in the image here, that's showing me magnification with the lens. So you get magnification factor by the ratios of the heights, which makes sense. We'll use this formula, it'll start to make sense as well. And so as you put this together, you can start to see light, how it starts from here on the axis, like we did with our first example, and focuses down to P2. And then you can have an actual object here and you can trace the rays and see how they all come out and reconverge here to give you the same part of that object there reappearing past the lens, also showing that parallel line, lines approaching a lens of rays of light all converge on the focal point at all from all points of the lens. I do want to note that you could get these same equations by just looking at the fact that this is the parallelogram and you basically would have similar triangles as well. So you could also use that to drive this. So at this point, let's use these equations and do an example calculation. And so I want to do a calculation for an object at P1 and an image at P2, meaning that this would be, you know, an object I'm looking at. Maybe it's a tree or maybe it's a, you know, it's a thumbtack. And then my eye is out here trying to observe this here at a real image here at this end, so I'm trying to observe what it looks like here at P2, okay? So, I'm going to assume that starting out here, Y1 is 8 centimeters. I am 8 centimeters above the Z-axis, and I'll assume that my position from the center of the lens, Z1, is 40 centimeters. So I'm 40 centimeters out, and my lens, I will have calculated knowing its refractive index and radius of curvatures. I would have Let's say that I designed this lens for a focal length of 15 centimeters, meaning right here at the focal point, all light that's parallel to the lens surface will converge here 15 centimeters past the center of the lens. So that's my focal point, and you can see that here, how it works there. All right. The other thing you can notice here is that as the light goes through here, you can see how it's changing angles and refracting, so you can see the little individual refraction showing up there. So let's finish our calculation now. So I'm going to first start with 
this equation here, 1 over f is easy. I gave you f, so I put 1 over 15 centimeters there. I have z1. I gave you that as 40 centimeters. Put that in 1 over 40. I'm going to solve for z2. I solve and find that z2 is 24 centimeters, meaning that the real image where I could observe this to be in focus, on this object to be in focus on the other side of the lens, would be 24 centimeters out on this side. Now, next thing I want to do is figure out what's the height here. Well, I will use this equation to get the height out here. And so I know y1, I gave you that, 8 centimeters, so I'll plug 8 centimeters into there for y1. I also now know both z1 and z2, right? Because I solved for z2 and I gave you z1. I'll put those in there. And if you do this calculation, you notice that there's this negative out here in front of z2. What's that negative do for us? Well, that negative forces y2 to become negative for a positive lens. And that makes sense because y2 is now below the z-axis. The image is inverted, which we expect. Okay? Remember when we looked at those images at the beginning of um, at the starting images, you could see the images that we were observing of the background were all inverted. I'll show you another example in a second. So y2 I can solve to be minus 4.82 centimeters. It's now looking smaller than the object. Okay. And the last thing is I can calculate the magnification factor m from this as well using that equation, and I find it's minus 0.06. Note, this minus here in front simply means in the magnification that the image is inverted. The fact that this is less than 1, 0.6 and not 1, means that the image is smaller, 0.6 smaller than the object. Okay, so it's just a multiplier. So here's a, you know, let's visualize this. There's a fern in the background, and in this case, your eye is close to this lens, and you can see the fern looks smaller. So that's just like the case we had on the previous slide, and the fern is now inverted. So you're seeing here how a large object at a large distance Z1 away from the lens, and if your eye is close to the lens, it'll appear inverted and smaller, just like we had in the previous case. Okay? If you want to play around with this and visualize this stuff, this is a really nice website here where you can basically set your object and it'll show you where the image is and in this simulator too it also shows you the focal point as this red dot and you can see how you can see focal point because here's a bunch of parallel rays coming at the lens and they all converge at the focal point okay and so you can move your your object closer to the lens in this case you move the object closer to the lens and look what happens here you get magnification it looks a lot bigger so if i use this as a magnifying glass i would take my lens put it close to the object and i would have my eye be further out here and then I can see the object being magnified into a larger image, okay? Now, you have to be careful for a positive lens. If you want to see a real image, something you could observe with your eye, the object always has to be beyond the focal point. In this case, the object is put in between the focal point and the lens. And if you do all the ray tracing, what you get is something called a virtual image behind here. We'll talk more about virtual images in a second, but you can't see this image. Okay. So that's enough at this point. Take a break. Make sure you can answer these, these types of questions. And we'll move on to some other type of lenses in a moment.